It's an absolute pleasure to be here to talk to you today about Kubernetes as your virtual DBA. I'm Karen Jex. I'm a senior solutions architect at Crunchy Data. This is a, a brief overview of my career to date. As you can see, it has been very database shaped. So I was a database administrator for 20 years, and then a database consultant, and now a senior solutions architect. And I still only work with databases, and in particular, Postgres. I'm supporting my uh, Postgres t-shirt, my Postgres earrings. So lots of people who have looking after databases as part of their remit aren't actually database administrators. So the task seems to fall more and more often to people whose expertise lies in other areas. That might be sysadmins, DevOps people, infrastructure teams, application developers. And this is particularly true in organizations where the databases are running on Kubernetes. So the databases are just seen as another part of that landscape. As Ilad mentioned earlier, the DBA, traditional DBA role seems to exist less and less. This isn't how you want your team to feel when they're told to look after databases on Kubernetes. So if you or your team find yourself in this situation, what do you do? Do you go out and suddenly um, try and learn to be a database administrator? Do you panic? Do you hope that the databases will magically look after themselves? Well, there have already been spoilers in earlier presentations today. A better option would be to use one of the Postgres or database operators for Kubernetes that have already been created for you by database experts. So let's have a look at how a Kubernetes database opera can act as your virtual DBA. So disclaimer, the details in this talk are based on Postgres because that's the RDBMS that I know and love, the one that I work with day to day. And any uh, diagrams or code snippets are particularly relevant to Postgres and also the crunchy data Postgres operator because, again, that's the one that I work with day to day. But the ideas will be relevant to whatever RDBMS you're using and whatever operator you choose to use. Okay, so we'll do a very quick recap of how database architecture has evolved. Uh, try to figure out what a DBA actually does so that we can think about what we need a virtual DBA to do. Uh, remind ourselves of some of the special features of Kubernetes that make it a good fit for managing databases and understand what a Postgres op operator for Kubernetes does. And finally, have a peek at how you could try that out for yourself. So in the beginning, databases were deployed on physical servers or bare metal, often one database cluster per server if you needed isolation, which means high overheads in terms of hardware and in terms of maintenance. Then virtualization came along in the, in the form of VMs. That meant that a single physical machine could now be carved up into multiple virtual machines and you could now deploy your databases to separate VMs if you wanted isolation, and overheads were somewhat reduced. Then containers came along. Their small footprint, the fact that they're self-contained and easy to deploy and all sorts of other useful features meant that many databases could now be deployed to a single physical server, each of them isolated from the others, and each managed completely independently. But it wasn't quite as simple as that to get people to see running uh, databases on, in containers um, as a, a kind of normal, acceptable idea. So not that many years ago, people thought that the idea of running databases in containers was completely crazy. This year, all of the customers that I work with are running some or all of their production databases in Kubernetes. Some are running multi-terabyte mission-critical databases. Some are running hundreds or thousands of databases. So what has changed? As I'm sure this audience already knows, a containerized environment is extremely flexible and scalable. Because containers are isolated, lightweight, and portable, and they can be created and destroyed quickly and easily, um, they give you those um, features of scalability and flexibility. But 
they're also stateless and ephemeral. And as you can imagine, those two words are not uh, amongst a DBA's favorite vocabulary. And even putting aside the stateless and ephemeral issues for now, organizations often manage hundreds or even thousands of databases, especially since a containerized environment is ideal for running lots of small databases rather than a few monoliths. Before container orchestration came along, and in particular Kubernetes, managing so many containers would feel a lot like herding cats. But what does a DBA actually do? What are the DBA tasks that we need Kubernetes to perform? Based on various definitions, and I'm not expecting you to read this, the general consensus is that a DBA will manage and secure computer systems that store data using specialist software, which unfortunately doesn't tell us very much about what a DBA actually does all day. So I compared uh, lists of responsibilities that went with the definitions in the previous slide, plus a sample of DBA job adverts to get a list of things that DBAs are actually expected to do. And it's a pretty long list. So the general consensus is that a DBA will do some or all of these tasks, ensure the availability of the database, usually including putting a high availability architecture in place, design, implement, and maintain database backup and recovery procedures, design and implement the required security procedures, manage database access, ensure data protection, implement monitoring processes, and perform ongoing monitoring of database performance, security, space, etc. Database design and development, including uh, data modeling, support and troubleshooting, including 24 by 7 on call, database software install and upgrade, liaising with and providing advice, support and expertise to other teams, performance tuning and enhancement, capacity planning, implementing necessary procedures for database creation and database maintenance. Ooh. Kubernetes takes care of and automates many of the things that would otherwise make managing large number of containers such a headache. And a lot of the things that it does already go a long way towards letting us manage a database environment, provisioning and deployment, configuring containers, scheduling, scaling up and down, recreating a failed container or other resource, creating services, managing storage, and with um, persistent volumes, we get around some of those pesky, stateless, and ephemeral issues. Allocating and scaling resources, load, load balancing, networking, and security. There are stateful sets where the pods aren't interchangeable, which is ideal for an HA database cluster with primary and standby databases, and sidecars, so you can deploy containers alongside your database container to do things like extracting metrics and managing back backups. But how do you go about setting up a containerized Postgres environment? Kubernetes doesn't na natively speak Postgres, so you need to put in place a mechanism to tell it how to manage your Postgres cluster, replication, how to do backup and recovery, how to perform failovers, how to do monitoring, upgrades, etc. And to do that, you need expert knowledge of two domains. You need expert knowledge of Postgres and of Kubernetes. And most organizations find it hard enough to find someone with expert knowledge of one of those domains, let alone both of them which is where the concept of the Kubernetes operator comes in, allowing you to extend Kubernetes using custom resources and the control loop, which will work to keep your environment in the state that you declare. And fortunately, as you already saw earlier in Peter's talk, there are various Postgres operators that have been created and maintained by Postgres experts, some of which have now been tried and tested in production environments for years. I can speak in detail about the Crunchy Data Postgres operator, Pigo, because that's the one that I work with day to day. But each of them combines that detailed Postgres and Kubernetes knowledge and expertise, allowing you to declare what your Postgres cluster should look like, and then rely on the features of Kubernetes, the operator, and integrated tools to keep it in the state that you've declared. So what do you want from an operator for Kubernetes? Well, the idea of a Kubernetes operator is that it performs the task that a human operator would otherwise perform. 
In the case of a Postgres operator, that's the task a DBA would otherwise perform. That means you want it to automate as many as possible of the tasks that we saw in that list of DBA responsibilities. I don't know of an operator that will do your database design and data modeling for you, and I'm not sure you'd want it to. That's one of the fun parts of the job, after all. But ideally, it will automate or at least help with the rest of your DBA tasks, such as database high availability. Most production database environments need some kind of high availability. They'll use Postgres's streaming replication to create one or more replica or standby databases. Then use a framework, for example, Petroni, that's what I've shown here, um, to manage the cluster. Often they'll use a tool such as HAProxy to maintain a virtual IP address that will always point to the current primary. As you can imagine, or maybe you don't have to imagine because you've already had to do it, setting up this kind of environment hand by hand can be fiddly and difficult to get right because there are quite a few moving parts with different tools and all of them need to be carefully configured. Having it all automated by the operator is a huge time saver and minimizes error. So now if something goes wrong with your primary database, you want to know that you'll get an automated failover, that one of the replicas will be promoted to be the new primary, and the other replicas will be configured to replicate from this new primary. Then through a combination of the operator logic, the self-healing features of Kubernetes, and in this case, the Petroni configuration, you should expect a new Postgres instance to be automatically created and integrated into the cluster as a replica to replace that failed primary. You want as much as possible of your backup and recovery to be automated by the operator. You want the operator install and configure a backup tool, for example, PG Backrest. It should let you define one or more backup repositories. So, for example, a local repo and a network or cloud repo using S3 type storage. It should take care of archiving your wall files. It should take care of backups of the database, storing them in the repo according to the schedule that you've configured. It should retry the backups if they fail and purge backups when they're no longer needed. To minimize stress, data loss, and downtime, you definitely want the auto, uh, operator to automate your database recovery process. And as well as your primary cluster, you probably want to be able to define a DR or standby cluster in a separate Kubernetes cluster, maybe in a different data center, kept up to date either via Postgres streaming replication, where changes are applied directly from the primary database, or by applying the walls that have been archived to your backup repository, or maybe even both. Although you want to be in charge of defining your security policies, you want the operator to provide you with the means to implement them. This includes things like maintaining the pghba.conf entries, creating users, encrypting passwords and storing them in secrets, configuring SSL and TLS, and managing the required certificates. Monitoring is a hugely important part of database administration. You have to know what's going on in your database so you're aware of potential issues and you can deal with them before they become emergencies. Rather than reinvent the wheel and create your own monitoring system and then uh, setting up your own alerts and dashboards, you can let the operator configure monitoring for you. So ideally, you'll get an A to Z monitoring architecture, for example, like this, with logging parameters, so the relevant information is captured in the database logs, stats exported from your database, metrics, alerts, and dashboards. Although the operator won't completely relieve you of support duties, it should mean that you're called on less frequently in the middle of the night. Because of the high availability and self-healing that we've already looked at, a lot of things, like a database going down, for example, will be handled automatically and transparently. The monitoring that's in place means that it's easy to keep an eye on things and notice if something needs attention. And the alerting means that you should already be made aware that something's going on before it becomes an emergency. So you'll hopefully only get involved if there's something more complicated going on that needs some detailed analysis. What about database software install and upgrade? Well, the install bit's easy because you don't need to do that. Uh, your database software and related tools will be pre-installed in your container images. 
And as for upgrades, the operator can use automated rolling updates to perform Postgres minor version upgrades. So when you want to upgrade, for example, from 16.3 to 16.4, you can simply change the, diver the version in the definition of your cluster, reapply it, and watch as the replicas are first updated. One of the replicas is promoted to the primary, and finally, the original primary is upgraded. An operator can even perform automated upgrades from one major version to another, either using PG upgrade or logical replication or PG dump and PG restore, depending on your requirements. Of course, even with all of that automa automation, major version upgrades will still require planning and testing. The operator won't take care of reading all of the release notes for you, looking to see whether any of the new features are useful to you, making sure that you're not using any deprecated functionality in your application, or testing your application thoroughly with the new version. That's still on you. Does the operator mean that we don't need database expertise? Well, as we saw, there's a lot of database expertise built into an operator, but you still need a human expert for strategic considerations, looking at the needs of the database application and considering business requirements. Again, some of the interesting parts of the job. The operator should help you with performance tuning, so um, it should be easy to set configuration parameters to appropriate values, increase resources when they're need when needed, configure connection pooling, and see what's going on in the database through PG stat statements and the monitoring that we already spoke about. In terms of capacity planning, the monitoring and alerting that you've got in place should already give you a good idea of how much space you're using, how it's growing, and how much you might need to add. And the combination of Kubernetes and the operator makes it easy to rescale. Some storage providers support dynamic scaling, and your operator might be able to take advantage of that to monitor and increase the space available to your database as needed. Um, if not, if you're using a storage class that supports resizing volumes, you can simply increase the amount of storage requested for your database and reapply the manifest. And even if your storage class doesn't support resizing volumes, you might be able to do a rolling rescale, so in a similar way to um, the way the Postgres minor upgrades were done. In terms of database creation and maintenance, most operators will let you define users and databases in your manifest by just adding a few lines of code. Database maintenance is a wide-ranging and very unspecific task, but this is a list of some of the things that might fall into that category. We've already looked at some of them, and the operator should let you schedule any remaining tasks that aren't automated. So now you're obviously really excited to give this a try and see the magic for yourself, but how can you do that? Well, first of all, beg, borrow, or build yourself a Kubernetes cluster. And then to try Pigo, Postgres operator from Crunchy Data, you can fork and clone the Postgres operator examples repo, which gives you instructions, helm charts, and customized manifests that will let you install the operator and create your first cluster. And similar resources are available for other operators. Um, Peter showed some information in his talk earlier. Um, you can install the operator using the customized file that's available for you in the install default folder, and that will create all of the necessary resources. And the one that we're interested in here is the Postgres cluster custom resource. That's what we're going to use to define our clusters. There are sample manifests in the repo, so you can just edit the sample postgres.yaml file that's made available for you to define what you want your cluster to look like. So this is the very simplest manifest. Obviously, you can add in all sorts of things to um, configure your, um, your cluster. But this one creates us a Postgres cluster that I've called KubeCon using Postgres 16 with three replicas and using the default storage class and requesting a one gigabyte volume. Optionally, you can configure a backup repository. So we do think that backups are super important, but we also know that for some things, like if you're doing restore testing, or if you're just creating a dev cluster that you're gonna use for a day and then get rid of, you don't want to back it up. So you don't have to use this part if you don't want to. 
Once you apply the manifest, the operator will create you a three-node high availability Postgres cluster with backups. So you can see here the pods that have been created. We've got an initial backup, the three Postgres pods, uh, the backup repo pod, uh, PG admin pod, because PG admin's available to you with this operator, uh, and the operator itself. The operator is then going to work to keep your cluster in that state, even if one of those components fails. By making changes to that simple manifest, you can then add some of the other features that we talked about. You can add backup schedules, uh, external backup repositories. You can um, implement the monitoring stack. You can define databases and users, uh, custom database parameters or PG backrest parameters. Uh, connection pooling, you can define a standby cluster, you can set resource requests and limits, etc. So, just to conclude, a Postgres operator for Kubernetes really can act as your virtual database administrator. We've seen that an operator automates most database administration tasks, from deployment of a high availability database environment to backup and recovery, monitoring, and even upgrades. It lets you implement a robust, secure, scalable, and easily manageable database architecture. It combines the strengths of Postgres and Kubernetes to keep your database cluster running smoothly. And it leaves you free to do just the strategic, interesting, and fun bits of database administration. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. So I'm inspired. I'm going to try. Great. But right now, I'm old school. I keep databases out of Kubernetes because I, I have to upgrade my Kubernetes infrastructure to the next point release every six months, and I don't want to be migrating my precious database every six months. Is there a best practice with, now with these operators? Um, is the Kubernetes infrastructure upgrades that I have mm -hmm. to do is, is on a completely different cycle from my data. And I want to leave my data alone. I don't want to have to reload it every six months. These are, are there best practices for um, uh, Postgres crossing Kubernetes point releases? So most of the time, the Kubernetes point release upgrade will be completely transparent to all of this. It, it won't be from, from my applications. So I build a new cluster and move everything over. OK. But you don't need to do that. No, I do need to do it because I have applications that require it. I don't trust anything in the new release. I, had, I do a deployment and A-B test to, to migrate over between point releases. I was just was wondering how the data, what's the best practice for database migrations when you're doing Kubernetes point releases? You, you're, you're, so yours is uh, upgrade in place? So this, uh, the operator that I'm talking about, I would probably use that standby cluster that I mentioned. So I would stand up a standby Postgres cluster on the new Kubernetes cluster, replicate to that new cluster, oh. and then promote it to be my new primary. You can do that? Okay, I'll study that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I have a quick follow-up, uh, just like the old school comment, right? So the two red marks uh, that you pointed, stateless and ephem ephemeral. So most of the times, like, I, I want to explore this. I've heard about data on Kubernetes, like, uh, especially Postgres, right? How do you, uh, I, I, I would not say convince, but like, how do you address someone uh, coming up? Oh, it, this is stateless, ephemeral. It's not going to work for database. How do you do that? Okay, so just to remind people, I am an old school DBA. I started being a DBA in 1998, so I really am an old school DBA, and I'm convinced. So the, the stateless and ephemeral, yes, your containers themselves are, but you've got the persistent volumes which contains all of your data. They don't go away when the container goes away. You can lose, you can kill your database pod and it doesn't matter, you don't lose any data because it's still there in the persistent volume. The new pod that's created to replace it will just point straight to that, that volume. You've got your data there, it's not going anywhere. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I have a question about maintenance, but just on a 
little bit different level. So whenever you have maintenance that requires, for example, to restart nodes of the cluster, mm -hmm. right? You are patching nodes or something like that. How do you deal with those situations? Because we already are inspired for a long time. We are running this in pro not in production, but on, in production actually as well on many systems. And whenever like uh, people are performing this kind of maintenance, sometimes the results are very, they're, they're either catastrophic in some cases and lead to uh, disaster recovery procedures, or they still require so many like, you know, extra steps, like for example, initiating a failover manually, right, if we're talking about Patroni, or like reinitting the replicas that, that are now down because they lost the timeline that they were replicating. So do you have any like best practice and suggestion of, of how to deal with these situations? So what kind of maintenance are you thinking of would, that would cause that kind of catastrophic failure? Uh, I'm thinking about patching the node underlying like server, Linux server where yep. this is running. And in case, obviously, if you have your data somewhere on an FS server, right, and it's like not located on this node, then you're good. But if your data is running directly on the node, like through like local volume or whatever, um, then it means that like this whole node is down now. If you reschedule your pod, it doesn't really matter because, you know, the data is detached from it. And uh, that's, that's what we're seeing like quite a bit. Okay, so it sounds like you, if you have some kind of maintenance on the node that's causing problems, if you've got an active database running there, then you might need to have some procedure where when you perform maintenance on that node, the first step is to perform a switchover. That's, that's always going to be the safest way and have the least impact on applications, etc. Okay. So that, that could be an option, and I'm assuming that your, your maintenance is all automated, so adding a, an extra automated step that does a switchover potentially wouldn't be a problem. But yeah. usually, um, maintenance on a node won't have a significant impact, because if you've got replication, and especially if you've implemented synchronous replication, you've not got a risk of data loss because it's already been propagated to your replica. And as long as your application is doing retries if necessary, I mean, that's the thing that some people forget, is that it's all very well having high availability database, but you've got to think from an application point of view as well. It's no good the database still running, but on a different node, if your application can't deal with that as well. Sorry. Yeah, so, so you answered it, and uh, just to summarize it, the main question was that operator is not concerned with this. We still want to go through Patroni steps that we would go even if it wasn't like a you know, Kubernetes-based system. Yeah, in theory, it shouldn't be necessary, but if you find that it is, then that's an extra step that you can add. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so I, I think you mentioned um, like explicitly exclu excluding schema management from these kind of tools. Do you consider like user account management and permission grants under that scope as well, or is that something that the operator would take care of? Oh, now that is a, a bigger question than I've got time to answer in the next two minutes. And okay, it's, maybe I'll chat um, with you after this then. <laughs> I, um, I can see advantages and disadvantages to the different methods. I would tend to manage users in terms of application users, so things that are kind of a part of the database structure that's going to be used by the application. I would tend to manage that here as part of the operator so that it's, it's all automated as part of that system. Uh, other things like you know, any individual users, et cetera, I probably wouldn't add into this. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, and then in terms of compatibility with other systems that are Postgres like, mm -hmm. how well does, does this play with those kind of systems or does it explicitly want like vanilla Postgres? You would probably have to create yourself because obviously this is based on images that use Postgres. You know, we don't change Postgres. It is just Postgres. So so you'd need to create yourself some images using okay. whatever and try it out. I have no idea, and I couldn't, you know. Sure. It, so if I just wanted to try this at home, but you know, if you want to, then. So if I just wanted that application user management perspective, I can't just like point it at a Postgres connection and have it manage those for me. It wants control over the whole database. Yeah, because the idea of the operator okay. is that it's managing that whole environment. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And one last question for Karen. Hi, thank you for your time. So, 
it looks like uh, from like an operator perspective, right, the, the persistent volumes are basically abstracted away. But then like if you're on a bare metal system where the per persistent volumes is backed by a single machine, right, like your operating mode of uh, maintenance for the database changes. Well, even though you have replication, right, like what, what he alluded to. So like, uh, what's the, I guess, the, the practice there? Like, do you have like an internal operator operate, uh, automating that on top of the like open source uh, Postgres operator? I guess that's the automation that's being I'm, injected there. I'm not sure I understand what it is you're asking. So you, you talked about the uh, system volumes being abstracted. Right, like, for, I guess like it's a, like, Let's say I'm, I'm deploying the Postgres operator on mm -hmm. bare metal machines, right? And the persistent volumes are basically tied to a machine unless like, you deploy like, a remote storage They don't have to be. Solution, it right? could be S3 storage. I mean, I didn't show it in the simple manifest, right. but you can configure your volumes wherever you want. You could have storage in the cloud. You can have local mm -hmm. volumes, whatever you want. Right, right. But then like, if I choose a local volume, then my operating model changes, right? And then I have to like basically extend the, that operator to like take that into consideration. I'm still not sure I fully understood your question, but I'm more than happy okay, to yeah, talk about check. it afterwards. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. We really appreciate it. Thank you.